Um, he's interested in uh, the analysis of chemical reaction networks to understand complexity and self-organization exhibited by living systems. And uh, he's going to give uh, a lecture on an information processing view of reaction networks. Thank you. Uh, am I audible at the back? Is there an echo? Uh, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here. I suppose I should thank Sandeep, the two Vijays, and Mukund, who's not here for the invitation. I think that it's. I like the title of uh, this program, Information Processing in Biology, because I think that's a point of view that's very close to my own research interests, and I would like to see this community sort of meet frequently and grow, and I'd like to see where that goes. Uh, so my own point of view is uh, I'm a computer scientist. My degrees are in computer science. Uh, I tend to think of biological systems from that point of view. So I tend to think of, so imagine that a spaceship has crash landed on Earth, and you went into the debris and you could extract something, you know it's a computer. You know this is the computer that flew the spaceship. But you have no idea how it works. You have no idea about what programming language is used, what hardware is used. All you know is it obeys the same laws of physics that you are familiar with, but you have no idea how to make sense of it. So this is the point of view that a computer scientist or an engineer brings to biological systems and tries to figure out how things work. Uh, this artwork that you see on the first slide, uh, it's a representation of an actual experiment that was carried out with DNA molecules uh, by Lulu Xian and Eric Winfrey and reported in Science in 2011. Uh, this experiment was done in the very lab where Carver Mead at Caltech came up with the idea of VLSI. Uh, what happened in this experiment was uh, they built uh, some 130 different, they designed some 130 different strands of DNA, DNA oligomers, very short strands, about 27 to 54 uh, base, bases long, single strands, put them all in a pot, and uh, these strands interacted among each other and computed the square root of a number up to two bits of precision. So, Essentially, they were able to recreate a small Boolean circuit using molecules of DNA. And the only interactions were these DNA molecules attaching and detaching due to hydrogen bonding. And the reason they could do this was because they introduced this level of abstraction called the seesaw gate, uh, which modeled certain simple interactions among DNA molecules. And they were able to think of composing these DNA gates so that together you could perform certain logical operations. Um, so of course, in the pot, these molecules of DNA were not arranged in any particular spatial or geometrical manner. They were just free floating molecules of DNA that found each other because of sequence alignment and sometimes got displaced due to other strands with longer regions of sequence alignment, and that's all that was going on. And using these kind of rules, they were able to do some interesting logical operations. Uh, question arises, why do this? Uh, an initial answer in this field was we want to do computing with molecules. Uh, but for me, the more interesting recent answers go in two directions. One is that by getting control over the nanoscale, we are able to build interesting technology that can interface with biological systems and that can also explicitly control processes going on at the nanoscale. The other answer is, um, you know, maybe there is, uh, maybe this can be scaled. This was small. This was about 130 molecules used to make a Boolean circuit that had about 38 gates and or not gates in it. Uh, it would be nice if we could do this to achieve a Boolean circuit that had you know, thousands of gates, you know, as big as the CPU inside your computer. That could be really interesting. But is it at all possible? Uh, we can look to nature for inspiration. 
this is a cartoon of a small part of a cell. Here is the cell wall. There are receptors sitting outside. The cell is collecting all kinds of information from its environment. And all this information is relevant to its survival. And all of it has to be correlated. It all has to be integrated in a way so that the cell is able to take decisions that maximize its chances of survival at a population level. Uh, and all that is happening at the shorter time scales. Uh, all that is done by these uh, you know, cell signaling pathways and all these uh, reaction networks that are going on inside the cell, in the cytoplasm. Uh, so just this bunch of molecules is apparently doing very sophisticated information processing tasks. So we have a prototype in some sense of what can be done. And we are nowhere near either understanding the abstraction by which this works or designing things that are much more complicated. But maybe we are on the right track. So this is something Richard Feynman said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So if I want to understand how this cell works, maybe one way to go about it is to try building uh, these small, simple molecules that I know everything about and to try to get them to exhibit interesting behavior. And in this process, maybe I will get stuck somewhere, and then I will go back and ask of biology exactly how it is solving that problem. And maybe I can take inspiration and go back to my engineering viewpoint and build a something more. And maybe that is the sort of conversation we want. So this point of view has been taken by a community uh, which has come together working on DNA molecules. And you can find more about it if you Google the Molecular Programming Project. Uh, I consider myself a part of this community. During my PhD days, I started working with DNA self-assembly. I actually worked in a lab uh, building DNA nanostructures. For example, I was able to use the technology of DNA origami to build cylinders and Mobius strips out of DNA molecules. Uh, since then, my research has focused more on reaction networks. and. This is a quote that I picked from a paper by Oishi and Clavins, which for me encapsulates why I find reaction networks so fascinating. So they say in building a design theory for chemistry. So already we should pause. Uh, this is a different approach to chemistry. We are not thinking of chemistry the way it has traditionally been thought of. But we are trying to ask, how do I design behavior? So if I want a particular behavior, for example, I want my chemistry to behave like a Boolean circuit, or I want my chemistry to do certain signal processing or information processing. How do I do it? Chemical reaction networks are usually the most natural intermediate representation, the middle of the hourglass. Many different high-level languages, for example, the seesaw gates and formalisms, have been and can likely be compiled down to chemical reactions. And chemical reactions themselves, as an abstract specification, can be implemented with a variety of low-level molecular mechanisms, for example, DNA molecules. So somehow, this level of abstraction seems to capture enough of uh, thermodynamics and enough of uh, the structure of reality without having all the details. And it allows us to work at even higher levels of abstraction and tie them to reality and make certain estimates about how likely these approaches are to work in the real world with molecules. So that's the point of view. Uh, there is a vast community of people who have been very interested in chemical reaction networks. And so this is what, so the motivation for many of these people does not come from the same direction as for me. Most of them, they are interested in chemical reaction networks because of more traditional systems biology problems, where you're given some biochemical networks that come out that have been, uh, that you have learned about from studying the cell. And now you want to say something about the dynamics. Uh, so this is roughly what the community was like, I would say, about uh, three years back. and. I went to a conference recently, and it's grown. It's now about you know 150 people, and it's growing very fast. Uh, and there are so it's a very interdisciplinary community. 
for example, David Anderson at University of Wisconsin Madison is an applied mathematician, probability theorist, and his interests have been in coming up with smart ways to you know, get computers to simulate chemical reaction networks. Uh, Jeremy Gunavardhane, in a previous life, was an algebraic geometer. Now he has a lab in systems biology at Harvard Medical School, where he's trying to build a virtual model of the cell. He has an active lab where he's doing experiments to validate many of these ideas and using chemical reaction networks to keep track of these. Uh, Ezra Miller is an algebraic geometer who's an expert on binomials and ideas related to binomials. And it turns out the mathematics of reaction networks have close ties to these ideas, and he has uh, been very interested in this. Uh, Eduardo Sontag is a control theorist, and he thinks of reaction networks as ways of implementing control systems within cells. So somehow, reaction networks have been the common language that have united people from all these different areas. So uh, here is the outline for today's talk. I want to give you a brief introduction to what reaction networks are and how they work. I'm going to assume that you know something about Markov chains, and I'm going to try to convince you that reaction networks are a small step beyond Markov chains. They are mathematically very natural objects. So that's why I say reaction networks are Markov chains plus plus. Uh, I want to tell you three short stories. This is a talk with sort of not just one result, but three short stories. Uh, I want to introduce this idea that this, so there is this ergodic theorem for reaction networks that has uh, seen a lot of mathematical activity over the past uh, five years, the past 10 years in particular. I'm going to tell you the story of that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a connection between, you know, information processing quantities like relative entropy and uh, the Lyapunov function for the dynamics of reaction networks, which gives us some structure on how these things behave. And finally, I'm going to uh, show you a reaction network that can do certain kinds of statistical estimation. And say a little bit about future directions that this field can go in. So here is sort of the big message of what I want to tell you in today's talk. This is the title of a very nice paper by Joel Cohen that was published in 2004 in PLOS Biology. It says, mathematics is biology's next microscope, only better. Biology is mathematics' next physics, only better. So if there is one takeaway message from this talk, I think this is it. OK, so I'm going to tell you what a reaction network is. Uh, how many of you have never seen a Markov chain before? OK, there is one person. So this is a Markov chain. Uh, so it has three states, one, two, three. And these are there are six transitions from one to two, from two to one, and so on. And each transition, I've written some symbol up there. It represents a positive real number, which is the rate of that transition. Uh, so I think of the Markov chain being in a state with a certain probability. So the probability p1 at time t represents, so the number p1 at time t represents the probability of being in state 1 at time t, and so on for p2 and p3. And this Markov chain has an evolution equation, which is called the master equation. And this is what it looks like. So the increase in p1 depends on how fast uh, things transition from 2 to 1, that is k21 times p2. And the decrease in p1 depends on how fast things flow away. I think I have missed out some terms. I have not written all the terms. Uh, and here is a reaction network. I have three species, x1, x2, x3. I have certain rates. And I can write down how concentrations change through time. And the point is, the equations are exactly the same. There will not be any difference. There is, so when I look at unimolecular reaction networks, I get back Markov chains. So reaction networks in this sense are an extension of Markov chains.
Sorry? Huh. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they look like they're not for this network. Uh, yeah, I think I added uh, the, the, some, yeah, so I, I think I should drop yeah. this one. The one three and the, uh, uh, yeah, the one three terms are not there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so I should drop, I, I think I should drop this one. And does that fix it? Okay. okay. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly this, right? So it doesn't have the, yeah, it's just one to two to, to three and three to one. Okay, then, yeah, three to, yeah, so I, I think I messed it up a little bit here. But if you do it right, it works out. Uh, this, oh, here, oh, is there something missing here? Oh, sorry, yeah, there should be something here. There should be an X3 here. Okay, so. Uh, what is a reaction network? Uh, here is another example, the lotka volterra system. I have two species, rabbits and foxes. Uh, rabbits can replicate. So one rabbit can become two rabbits. Or a rabbit can meet a fox. And the fox eats up the rabbit and becomes two foxes. And we all know that's how it happens in nature. So, and fox die. Right? So there is a message in this model. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. And turns out the lotka volterra model is a useful model to, you know, keep track of uh, numbers in ecology. So I'm going to introduce another representation right here for the lotka volterra for reaction networks in general. So I'm going to represent this axis as number of rabbits, this axis as number of foxes. So this reaction, I'm going to write as this arrow. Right, starting from the vector one rabbit zero foxes, so one comma zero, going to the vector two rabbit zero foxes, two comma zero. Right, and similarly, this reaction becomes this arrow, from one comma one to zero comma two. This reaction becomes this arrow. So a reaction network is a graph whose vertices are positive integer vectors. So fix a set of species. A reaction network is a graph with vertices in the non-negative integers to the power s. And C is called the set of complexes. So here the complex is rabbit plus fox is a complex. Two foxes is a complex. Rabbit is a species, but it's also a complex in this reaction network because it is one of the nodes in. So these are the complexes. All these vertices are called complexes. And yeah, these are the reactions, the three reactions. So this is all that I'm going to call a reaction network. It can have all kinds of reactions that you might not otherwise think of as chemical reactions. You can have things disappearing like here. You can have things emerging out of nothing. That's all allowed. Uh, Given a reaction network, one writes down dynamics in various ways. One of the most common ways of writing down dynamics is mass action kinetics. Um, so this is what the differential equations look like. Uh, so here is a contribution due to the first reaction. So what happens when the first reaction occurs is one rabbit is created, no foxes are created. So I have this vector 1, 0. And the rate at which the first reaction happens there is some rate constant k1 times the number of rabbits. So the more rabbits there are, the faster they will multiply. Then there is a contribution due to the second reaction, which reduces one rabbit and increases one fox. So it's minus one plus one. And the rate at which this reaction happens depends on how fast rabbits meet foxes. So there is this product term of rabbits times foxes. And there is a scaling constant there. And similarly for the third reaction. So in general, if I have a bunch of reactions where y and y prime are my integer vectors, then a reaction network, so then the mass action equation is, so x here is a vector of concentration. So x dot equals, now this is a vector y prime minus y, it's the change caused by that reaction y goes to y prime. And the rate at which this reaction happens depends on this monomial term x to the power y 
and some positive real number rate constant. So let's see that again since this is sort of main tool for this talk. So I have a rate function k for a reaction network, which for every reaction gives me a positive real number. And this is the notation I'm using, a vector of concentrations. It's indexed by all the species. So if I have species rabbits and foxes, it's a vector consisting of num concentration of rabbits and concentration of foxes. And this monomial is a product. So this is again notation. It's a product over xi to the power yi, because these are all the different species that have to come together for the reaction to happen. And uh, the flow for a reaction is this quantity, the rate, the specific rate times this monomial term. And then mass action kinetics is the sum of the flow times the change caused by the reaction. Uh, so it turns out these are very natural mathematical objects. It's just, you know, it's essentially just a graph embedded in an integer lattice. Um, so one would expect that these objects would occur in many different areas beyond chemistry, and indeed this is the case. Um, Carl Petrie found them very useful to describe distributed computer systems. They have been, they come up in population genetics as the recombination equations. A special case comes up. Um, in computer science, uh, various people have looked at them at a special case again as quadratic dynamical systems. And there are sort of more general structures underlying these things. And they allow very rich dynamics. You can have something exploding in finite time. The lotka volterra system gives us uh, periodic oscillations. Um, this is something I just wrote down, which turns out to have the same phase portrait as the Lorentz attractor, which is a well-known model for chaos. Or you can have things that sort of have the phase portrait similar to the simple harmonic oscillator. So you can have really all kinds of behavior. Um, so one might think, you know, I'm losing, I wanted to say something about Markov chains plus plus, and Markov chains have lots of nice theorems. But if this is so expressive, it gives us all kinds of dynamics, then maybe I'm losing that link. So I want to try to maintain that link, and that motivates us to find a smaller class of reaction networks that are actually well behaved, that properly include Markov chains, but are still well behaved. And that leads to this notion of complex balance, which is uh, due to Martin Feinberg going back to 1972. Uh, so a reaction network is complex balanced. if there exists a particular concentration which does something. So I want this concentration to behave essentially like the stationary point for a Markov chain. So how does the definition work out here? So take a complex. Remember a complex is a vertex in my reaction network graph. And for this com complex, the inflow must equal the outflow. So look at all uh, arrows pointing in and each single arrow has some flow through it, which is the specific rate times this monomial term at, at alpha. I'm evaluating it at alpha. Well, this alpha is the special point given to me. So I take the sum of all the inflow, and similarly, I take the sum over all the outflow, and I want this to be equal. So if this is true for all complexes y, then I say, that the reaction network is complex balanced, and further this point alpha is a point of complex balance. So not all reaction networks are complex balanced. In particular, if I just have uh, two complexes and a single reaction going in one direction, it can never be complex balanced. So, the plan now is to tell you about the ergodic theorem for reaction networks. Um, before I can do that, yeah. So a system of chemical reactions with some equilibrium is complex um, So is, is, is that the thing that basically 
No, no, so it can come to equilibrium, but yeah, there could still be, be no, so that's not true. So, so you have the ODE system, right? So you essentially have x dot equals some polynomial of the right hand side. So equilibrium just means that there is f of some alpha equals 0. No, that's steady state. So for a mathematician, this is what equilibrium would mean. So yes, so there is detailed balance. There are systems that are complex balanced but not detailed balanced. Yes. So if you but insist that equilibrium if means. If it is detailed balanced, it will be complex. No. no. Oh yes, that's true. If it is detailed balanced, then in particular it will be complex balanced for the simple reason that yeah, every true. reaction will be reversible, and so the flows will take care. So I can do the I can do the calculation at the level of you know this this single pair of edges, yes. right? It cancels out at the single pair of edges. But the claim is that the class of complex balance is much larger. It's much larger. It does not require that reactions be reversible. I can include cycles and unions of cycles and all kinds of things. So the balance here is only steady. St I mean, uh, you, you have fixed points, but no, no cycles. All of those do not belong to this definition, right? What so, you so if you had an oscillatory solution, ah. that would not be complex balanced. Or do you have some generalization with which you can also talk about those? So all this is saying is at the level of the reaction network, right? So now if I write down a reaction network that is complex balanced, one can ask the question, what happens to its dynamics? Right? Can it have oscillatory solutions? And in some sense, the ergodic theorem for reaction networks will say or assert that oscillations cannot happen. In fact, everything must go to a stationary point. Right? Essentially, that's what we're going to say two slides down the road. I want to give you a setup for that and then say it formally and then show you that it's a, it's a non-trivial thing to show. Okay, so before I can say that, in Markov chains, uh, the ergodic theorem for Markov chain says if I have an irreducible Markov chain, there is a unique stationary point and everything goes there. So irreducible is this idea of connectivity. Where can I reach given that I am somewhere? So one wants, so if I don't have irreducible, I can have multiple things and depending on where I start, I go to that point. So to capture that idea, I need this notion of the stoichiometric subspace. So this was what my dynamics looked like. Right? This was my mass action kinetics. I'm going to define the stoichiometric subspace as a linear subspace spanned by y prime minus y. And what is the point of defining this? The point is that the derivative is always in this space because of course it's formed by a linear combination of y prime minus y. It is completely obvious that x dot is in h. And as a result, if I start at x0, then xt minus x0 will always remain in H. So one defines this invariant polytope, which corresponds to the notion of an irreducible Markov chain. So this is, start the, take the translate of H in which x sits and intersect it with the positive cone, with the positive orthant, and this polytope is invariant under mass action kinetics. And then one wants to say that for this invariant polytope, there is a unique uh, point of uh, stationary point and all flow goes there. That's the kind of idea we want to build up. And this is called Birch's theorem. Part of this is called Birch's theorem. So Birch's theorem says, uh, I'm given a complex balance system. What does that mean? I'm given some species, say rabbits and foxes. I'm given some complexes. I'm given some reactions, so together a reaction network. I'm given some rates, and I'm given an alpha, a special vector of concentrations that obeys the complex balance condition. So together, every invariant polytope contains a unique positive fixed point x star. So far by fixed point, I only mean that all derivatives of concentrations vanish according to mass action kinetics. Further, this turns out to be a point of complex balance. And how does one show this? Uh, one takes this function, which is xi log xi minus xi minus xi log alpha. I. It turns out that this is decreasing along trajectories. 
And this function turns out to have a very nice structure. It's strictly convex. And uh, you're essentially, you know, think of the level sets of this function like the layers of an onion. And your translate of uh, your invariant polytope, it's, it's essentially like taking a knife and cutting through an onion. And there will be a unique point where you are closest to the core of the onion. And that's this unique point. So the ergodic theorem the, for Markov chains, the corresponding thing is called the global attractor conjecture for reaction networks. So we have to say a little more. All we have said is there exists this point. We haven't said that all the flow goes there. So this is what it essentially asserts. It asserts that this point x star that we found, it's a global attractor in px. No matter where we start in this invariant polytope, we go to x star. And this was uh, conjectured by Horn and Jackson in, this was asserted by Horn and Jackson in 1972, uh, and Horn realized it was open in 1974, and it's been open since then. It's still open. There is a very strong claim to have proved it, but it's the, commu the community is still looking at the claim. Uh, so why is this so difficult? I mean, we have this Lyapunov function. It's strictly convex, so its level sets look something like this. So if I start somewhere over here, and the Lyapunov function is always decreasing, it's going to force me in, and it seems like I can't escape anywhere. I will fall into that unique point, which is my point x star. The difficulty is that the level sets of the Lyapunov function start meeting the boundary. So if I start far enough away, there are trajectories that are decreasing in the Lyapunov function but get stuck on the boundary. So that's all. That's the difficulty. If we can prove that trajectories will not get stuck on the boundary, what does this mean for species? If we can prove that species do not go extinct for complex balance systems, then we have settled this conjecture. OK. So uh, recently, there was a, a vast generalization of this species does not go extinct conjecture. Instead of making it for complex balance systems, Krasiu, Nazarov, and Pantia introduced this. Uh, so they, they believed that this conjecture should be true for a much larger class of systems. They said, look at that reaction diagram, all those arrows that are stuck in the integer lattice. If the reaction arrows are roughly pointing inward, and they have a precise notion of what it means, but I'm not going into it right now, then somehow the dynamics should not take you to the boundary. Things should not go extinct. And uh, they were able to prove this for the case of two species, but not in general. But they were able to show that if you can show this, the global attractor conjecture follows. Because uh, complex balance systems, it turns out, will be a special case of such systems, endotactic systems. What we were able to show, so with my collaborators Ezra Miller and Ann Xu, was uh, that if a reaction network points strongly inwards, a weakening of their, so a strengthening of their condition, instead of just pointing inwards, something slightly stronger than what they assume, then we can indeed prove their conjecture. We can prove that the dynamics points inwards in a very precise sense. And this is true for you know, arbitrary number of species and arbitrary networks, and we don't need complex balance. This is not enough to prove the global attractor conjecture, but it's still, so, as of today, the strongest result towards the global attractor conjecture. Uh, and it turns out it has some practical applications. Uh, Johnson, Pantia, and Donnell were able to take the circadian clock network, which is a very well-studied network. And they could confirm that it is strongly endotactic, which gives them some very strong stability results about the circadian clock network, which was not known before. Um, so I want to give you a one slide uh, sort of uh, idea of what goes into this proof. And I won't be able to go into the details because it's sort of, you know, it's it took us about 60 pages of math to get all the details done. But here is sort of a one, one slide overview. So a very important map, it turns out, in the study of reaction networks is this logarithm map. So you take x, y, for example, if you could have more species, 
and you take coordinate wise logarithm and what this coordinate wise logarithm does is it takes certain rays you know certain uh, uh, curves for example a curve that is parameterized by t and goes like t to the power a comma t to the power b this map takes it to a line in the direction ab and this turns out to be a very valuable idea uh, so we call this a toric ray these kind of rays and the nice thing about toric rays is it comes from an observation about the lyapunov function we have been working with which had this form of x log x minus x the gradient of this function looks like log x so essentially what this is saying is toric rays and functions like this are very well adapted to each other this function if i look at its gradient at all points on this on this ray it turns out the gradient stays parallel it's always pointing in the same direction and that makes such rays very useful for computations with this function because if i want to know the if i want to prove it is a lyapunov function i want to take its time derivative so the gradient comes in and if i already know the direction of the gradient that's a big help so let's do an example here is a reaction network i hope you can see the three arrows this looks like the lotka volterra system but it's not i've reversed every arrow and as soon as i reverse every arrow it turns out this becomes strongly endotactic it falls into our class and our theorem asserts that this will be uh, you know this will be well behaved so there will be some uh, compact set inside the in the interior so that all flow ends up in the compact set so what is the idea the idea is there are these three reactions all of them are contributing and how do i play them against each other so the amount that a reaction contributes is given by this monomial x to the power p y to the power q where p comma q is uh, for example 0 comma 2 or it could be 0 comma 0 or it could be 2 comma 0 depending on which reaction i am looking at and so this can be rewritten as uh, t to the power an inner product and if i want to know which reaction is more important i have to figure out which inner product is more important which inner product is larger and that becomes a combinatorial geometry problem on this space so we have reduced the computation of the time derivative of this function to a combinatorial geometry problem on polyhedra and so finally we want to compute this kind of so this is the contribution of the reaction y goes to y prime to the time derivative of a function like this and it turns out to be this turns out to be what happens to first order but then there is a second order and a third order like there are corrections to do and one has to sort of play this off correctly uh, and this is still not enough because all we'll get out is a lyapunov function uh, but the nice thing is we get lyapunov functions for a larger class previously we got it only for complex balance but now we are getting it for the class of strongly endotactic networks and for strongly endotactic networks it turns out that uh, you can sort of you can do an induct you can project out so if you forget some species but you assume that its concentration is bounded then you can replace that species by some kind of a rate constant which is not a number but some interval of values and you can do induction to uh, okay so you can do this uh, so somehow it turns out that going after this problem of the global attractor conjecture one has to make connections with ideas from many different areas the lyapunov function itself sort of uh, seems like uh, it might remind you of relative entropy it might remind you of you know helmholtz free energy from statistical mechanics there are some ideas from algebraic geometry that come in and from combinatorics so this is one of the nice things i think about reaction networks that they seem to be mathematical set mathematically central and they seem to lead to interesting questions questions that are interesting in their own mathematical right apart from biology so i think this is sort of maybe one place where one can say that biology is indeed mathematics next, next physics where we are finding interesting questions for mathematics to investigate uh, so i want to go on to my second story uh, which is about the origins of the lyapunov function so this is what the lyapunov function we used to look like for reaction networks uh, 
And this is what relative entropy looks like. And this is a quantity very familiar to, do, to you if you have ever done anything related to information theory. And one might wonder where this comes from. Is this some kind of a free energy function? If so, what is its combinatorial interpretation? Or does it have any kind of information theoretic interpretation? How is it connected to this relative entropy? Uh, so one would like to say something like this. One would like to say that you know there is this connection between statistical mechanics and information theory, which uh, uh, sort of relates free energy to relative entropy, which is completely different field of work. I'm not going to talk about it in today's talk, but these ideas, this circle of ideas is well known. And uh, there is a suspicion, one wants to say this, that Lyapunov function is something like free energy. And what we will show is that this can be made precise. That Lyapunov function and relative entropy, there is a very clear connection that can be made precise. Uh, so what I like about this is that mathematics is somehow, you know, we want to say that these systems are doing information processing. But there are so many ways of saying this. This kind of analysis, I believe, is sort of getting rid of many of the ways of saying this and forcing us to make certain choices. So it sort of reminds me of what uh, Wordsworth said about sonnets in a sonnet. Uh, he said, and hence for me, in sundry moods, to us pastime to be bound within the sonnet's scanty plot of ground, pleased if some souls for such their needs must be, who have felt the weight of too much liberty, should find brief solace there, as I have found. Uh, so yeah, the hope is somehow mathematics will guide us towards the right way of looking at how these systems do information processing. Um, so here is, uh, to make this link precise, we need to look at another dynamical model for reaction networks, which is the stochastic model. So the idea is, let me do an example. I won't do it in general now. So I just have a single reversible reaction. 2y goes to 3x. And now my state space, I'm going to give a Markov chain, an actual Markov chain. My state space is going to keep track of number of molecules of x and number of molecules of y, not concentrations. So I have nx, ny, where nx, ny are all positive integers, non-negative integers. So if I start here, because of uh, every reaction changing x and y in a particular way, I can only go in this direction. I can only decrease x by 3 and increase y by 2 or the other way around. So I, I can restrict myself to studying this line. And now, how does this describe a Markov chain? I need to give you some rates. So I need to tell you what is the rate here, what is the rate here. And these rates may depend on the numbers, right? on the actual population that I have. The, how fast the reaction happen, reactions happen may depend on the population. So this is what the rates look like. For, the, for this reaction to happen, so that is for 2y to go to 3x, I need 2y to meet. And the number of ways that two molecules of y can meet depends on ny choose 2, and then there is a constant. And similarly, number of ways that 3x can meet depends on nx choose 3, and then there is a constant. You can ignore this two factorial, three factorial here. I've just put it in there so that when I take the limit as the number of molecules goes to infinity, this k1 and k2 becomes the same constant that we had for the mass action rates. So yeah, so you can do this in general, given a network of reactions, you can write down a Markov chain in this way. And it is known due to Tom Kurtz in 1972, that one can get the mass action ODE as a volume limit of this. So one can divide the number of molecules by volume and then take the limit as number of molecules goes to infinity, volume goes to infinity. And if done the right way, you get the mass action ODE. Uh, it is also known due to more recent work by Anderson, Krasiun, and Kurtz that if, my, if I start with a network, that is complex balanced, then the Markov chain has a stationary distribution. And in fact, the stationary distribution is a product of Poissons, which essentially means that at the stationary distribution, each uh, individual species uh, sort of uh, assaults itself in a way that's uh, essentially independent of all the other species, even though the reactions are making them all interact. So here is what we could show. Uh, 
if a reaction network is complex balanced, then this Lyapunov function, which is a quantity for the mass action limit, is indeed the volume limit of the relative entropy, where pi is the stationary distribution for the complex balance system. So you indeed get this quantity out as a volume limit of this quantity. So you take this quantity and you divide it appropriately by volume and then you take the volume limit, you get out the other quantity. So that justifies thinking of this as some kind of free energy or some kind of information processing quantity. Uh, so I will move on to my third story. Uh, so we are interested in building something using reaction networks that will process information in some way that can be a model of biology or by itself that might have some technological interest. Uh, and people have proposed many such schemes. So people have shown how to do Turing machines with reaction networks, how to do Boolean circuits, linear input output systems, analog electronic circuits. Many of these have also been implemented in the lab. Algebraic functions and more recently Knapp and Adams have shown how to compute marginals of a joint distribution. Uh, so one question arises, uh, what is the right way? How can we extract the maximum amount of computation out of a reaction network? And is there some model of computation that is native to reaction networks? So I don't know, I'm nowhere near giving a definitive answer to that, to that, but I'm going to make a small proposal in that direction, which is to look at statistical inference. And I'm going to say that there are some nice things about the structure of statistical inference problems, which allows us to exploit the mathematical structure that we have looked at so far, and may lead us to believe that, you know, if we were, that the cell might actually be doing some kind of statistical inference at a systems level. Uh, so I'm going to do statistical inference in a very specific setting of log linear models. And you have all seen log linear models in some form. You may have seen them as Gibbs families of distributions or exponential families. It's essentially the same thing. People use various names. Uh, so here is an example of a log linear model. Uh, I have three possible, so think of a dice that has three sides. I roll it and it can either come up x1 or x2 or x3. And which outcome I get depends on some hidden parameter. So the dice has two settings, theta1 and theta2. And once that theta1 and theta2 are set, I get x1 with probability theta1 square, x2 with probability theta1 theta2, and x3 with probability theta2 square. Yeah. So in general, a log linear model is described by uh, collecting these exponents into a matrix called the design matrix. So x1, x2, x3 become the columns, theta1, theta2 become the rows, and these exponents become the entries of this matrix. And so to describe a log linear model, given a matrix, you write down such monomials. And if you are thinking of where the Gibbs distribution is, if instead of theta1, you wrote this as e to the minus an energy one, then it starts looking like some sort of Gibbs distribution. So the problem I'm going to show you how to solve is the problem of maximum likelihood. So you have tossed your dice, three-sided dice, several times, and you found that u1 fraction of the time you got x1, u2 fraction of the time you got x2, and u3 fraction of the time you got x3. And you don't know what theta1, theta2 are, you want to find them out. So what is your best estimate for theta1, theta2? You can look at the maximum likelihood estimator, which is this quantity. So maximize the probability of getting these frequencies if the parameter were theta1, theta2. So maximize this probability over all theta1, theta2. And that argument which maximizes this term, call it the maximum likelihood estimator. It's your best guess about theta1, theta2 given the dice outcome. I'm going to introduce another term because it will be useful for me later on. I'm going to define the maximum likelihood distribution as the distribution, as the probability of getting x1, x2, x3 
if I believe you know in theta 1 theta 2. So this looks like theta 1 square according to this theta 1 theta 2 theta 2 square at the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, so here is the recipe for getting maximum likelihood distributions from reaction networks. Uh, you are given a design matrix A. Compute the basis of the kernel. So here is the design matrix. The kernel is one dimensional here and it turns out it is spanned by this vector 1 minus 2 1. Convert this basis element to a reversible reaction as follows. So whenever you have a minus make it a species on the other side and all the pluses collect them on one side. Take your frequency data, convert it into initial conditions as follows. Apply mass action kinetics with unit rates. So this is what you get. And it turns out the equilibrium point is the maximum likelihood distribution. So why does this work? Uh, so the answer really goes back to some structures that were already, you know, there is a nice mathematical connection between log linear models in statistics and reaction networks. This has to do with that logarithm function being so central in reaction networks. And this was already pointed out by Krasiun and Miller, etc. This is sort of, so my work is sort of the first to actually spell out how this would do computation. Uh, so here is the intuition to say it in a different way. So the maximum likelihood distribution turns out to be the one that maximizes Shannon entropy subject to this condition that I want to respect AP equals AU. So P star respects this. So AP star also equals AU but it maximizes Shannon entropy. So I have arranged my reaction network constraints so that it matches the maximum likelihood distribution problem. It matches these constraints. I see something wrong. Okay. I did this by making sure that the reactions come from the kernel of this matrix. And because I chose all my specific rates as one, my mass action kinetics, which minimizes a certain free energy, uh, the free energy, the negative of the free energy became essentially Shannon entropy. And so my mass action kinetics was maximizing entropy. And uh, we know from Birch's theorem and uh, global convergence, which we can prove outright for this system, that the dynamics reaches the maximizer. And most of the effort in proving this works actually goes in proving global convergence for this class of systems. It doesn't fall nicely into any of the previous classes. So this is sort of the big picture. Uh, how do we get the maximum likelihood estimator from this? We proceed as before, but this is the new step. Take every column and convert it into two reactions, two irreversible reactions. So the column 2, 0 becomes 2 theta 1 goes to 0 and x1 goes to x1 plus 2 theta 1. So x1 being the uh, species corresponding to the first column and so on for the other two columns. And this is essentially doing the job of uh, given the maximum likelihood distribution to get the maximum likelihood estimator you have to take certain square roots and so on. And this is doing the job of that computation. And you proceed as before. You take your initial conditions. It doesn't matter what theta you take initially and you apply mass action and the equilibrium turns out to be the right thing. And you still have to prove global convergence. So very quickly, here is what we did. You give me a design matrix whose entries are integers. And this is a condition I need. I have not mentioned it before. Column sums need to be equal. Uh, and you take the kernel. But to be precise, you take a basis for the free group sitting inside the kernel. And that's what lets you convert all of these into reversible reactions. So you define a reaction network <coughs> whose species correspond to the columns of, my of the design matrix. And for each element of this basis, you introduce a reversible reaction. And then find a larger reaction network, which 
in addition to these reactions contains certain irreversible reactions coming from the columns of the matrix. And then the results, the two theorems say that this computes the maximum likelihood distribution and this computes the maximum likelihood estimate. So, uh, where does this go next? Uh, so, one problem with what I showed you is that the design matrix can be very large. I just spoke of, you know, tossing one dice three times, but if I had ten dice, it would already be an exponentially large number of outcomes and the design matrix becomes very large. Correspondingly, the number of reactions needed, the number of species needed can blow up. So, one doesn't like that very much. It's probably not the way that biology is doing things. So, uh, so one really wants to be thinking of uh, something else that will allow us to represent high dimensional distributions in a compact way. And one way of doing that is something called a graphical model. So, can we do similar things? Can we do maximum likelihood estimators for graphical models? And how does this connect to ideas in machine learning like deep Boltzmann machines and so on? Uh, and maybe if we go down this path, uh, maybe in two or three generations of theory, we will have a way of thinking of statistical in inference using reaction networks. And that will not be too different from what cells are doing. Ideally, that is what I would like. That is the hope or the dream that one comes up with some theoretical construction and then sort of compares it against biology and uh, sees certain yeah, commonalities and differences. So, maybe this is a place where we still need to work on our microscope a little bit, but maybe if this happens, mathematics can become biology's next microscope. Uh, so, here is what I told you. I told you about reaction networks, mass action kinetics, and the chemical master equation. And I told you the th three stories about the global attractor conjecture, connection between the Lyapunov function and relative entropy, and maximum likelihood estimators for log linear models with reactions. Uh, there are a couple of other, there is one more thing that I work on, I'll put up a slide on it just so if someone wants to talk with me about it, I'm most happy to. I've been very interested in how much energy is required to compute. For example, a steam engine, uh, by studying a steam engine, we learned that to do work you need energy, but can one say something similar about computers? So it, the people have said a lot about this, there is a lot of literature on this and it's a sort of uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very hard problem. So I started to look at much simpler instances, a single bit, a battery, a clock, and things like that. And so I have a couple of papers in that direction. The, so one paper on sort of the cost of erasing if I want to do it fast, and the bit has to keep its memory for a long time when it's not being erased. And Another where we are exploring the notion, you know, we are exploring the physics of a bistable potential and what happens if we try to erase in that setting. And another where we are looking at the thermodynamics of clocks. And these two are in progress. Uh, so I am done. I will just put up some references and thank you for your time. A very nice talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a question regarding the third um, short story. So before you even said this last slide, yeah, MLE for graphical models. So if I think of Gaussian, so what limits you to the discrete setting? I mean, if you think of Gaussian graphical models, it seems like everything, sh I mean, it seems like, like all these algorithms by speed and Kiveri or so on for, for actually computing MLE seems to fit exactly in this framework. Is uh, that true or no? I'd like to discuss that with you. I'm not, I mean, I haven't looked at it, so it would be a new investigation for me, but I'd be very interested in learning that. Yeah. Because so the partial correlations seem to be exactly your edge weights, right? In your network, for example. Let's try to work something on the back. And another question is, so about duality. I mean, for these log linear models, you always have the dual framework. What would be the dual of your reaction network? Have you thought of that? So there are some notions of duality in reaction networks. For example, you know, so it's uh, instead of species having, you know, we are tracking species, but we could also track how much flow has gone through reactions, and we could write down differential equations for those flows. There are dual differential equation constructions also.
Is, is there any equivalent uh, of Shannon's coding theorems for reaction networks like capacity of a reaction network or uh, I mean the, the usual coding theorems of Shannon? I think these are excellent questions. I think this is an area that has not been investigated enough. So I think broadly this area of information processing and reaction networks, I think a lot more can be done. If you compare sort of the neural network world, I think much more has been done there than the reaction network world. I understand correctly, if I have a network that has complex balance and I take, a, take snapshots in its steady state, then in the stochastic framework, the prediction is that the probability distribution factorizes. Correct. So that means that conversely, if I take snapshots of a network that appears to be in steady state experimentally, and I observe correlations in the fluctuations of the concentration of the species, complex. it's not complex balance. That's correct. That's correct. Yes, <clears throat> sorry, I was just uh, wondering about the clarification. So when a network is complex balanced, you said that it converges to a fixed point. Is that true or not? So that is still open, but it is strongly believed in the field, and there is a claimed proof for it out there by George Krasiun. And yeah, people are still reading it. It's sort of a long proof. Yeah. Okay, and then you have this definition of an inward pointing network. Is that right? Um, you have a definition of an inward pointing yeah. network. That's endotactic, and our uh, our modification to it, which is strongly endotactic. Yeah. Okay, and you say all these networks are complex balanced? Or? No, complex oh. balance. So, so this is complex balance. And we have a larger class, which is inward pointing or endotactic. And the class that we have defined is something like this, which is strongly endotactic. OK, and so the uh, circadian clock is endotactic, but not complex balanced. Uh, yeah, that's correct. OK, thank you. Are there uh, other questions? So given a reaction network, we can then for also form, a, is it possible to form a, like, what, what is it most likely estimation, estimating? Like you showed that if you have a, a maximum likelihood pro estimation problem, then you can form a, you can get the kernel and write a reaction network which will give it the value. So given a reaction network, I can go other way around and... Yeah, so I mean, given a reaction network, you want to ask what statistical problem is it solving, right? That's the kind of... Uh, one or many or... Yeah. Uh, it's like, uh, I mean... So in software engineering, if you are given some code, it's very hard to figure out what it does. But if you are asked to write a program, it's often much easier. So I see it in that sense. I think that um, if you know that somebody is solving the same problem you are solving and you write the code first, then you proceed in certain ways. And then if you compare, it might be easier rather than directly going into the code and trying to figure out what it is doing. I mean, this is sort of a philosophical, not in a good way. Other questions? If not, uh, let's thank uh, Manoj again. <laughs>